A man named Matteo Ricci was born in the year 1552 in Italy. And while he was still a young man, he became one of the world's leading experts in science and mathematics. Matteo Ricci was a devout Christian, and as a young man, he sensed God's call on his life to go as a missionary to China. And his goal was to take the Christian message right into the heart of Beijing, right into the, the heart of the capital city, and even actually into the forbidden city itself, which was the imperial palace. In 1601, it took him nearly 50 years to get there, but in 1601, uh, Matteo Ricci did just that. He became the first Westerner ever to enter the Forbidden City. Ricci placed himself in service to the Ming Emperor, whose name was Wan Li. Wan Li was amazed at the maps of the world that Matteo Ricci was able to bring with him and translate into Chinese. The Chinese did not yet have full maps of the globe. Matteo Ricci also became famous in the Imperial Palace for his mastery of astronomy. He was able to accurately predict several eclipses. Ricci was able to master Chinese literature, the classics, Confucianism, and translate many of those works into Western languages for the first time. Previously, the Chinese had thought that Westerners were barbarians, and funny enough, uh, Westerners thought the same thing about the Chinese. But through Ricci's work in the Imperial Palace, a number of powerful Chinese officials became followers of Jesus Christ. Churches were built, and Ricci believed that the most effective way to reach China with the gospel was to start at the commanding heights of the culture and to bridge those large gaps with with skill and with knowledge and training, and, and that's exactly what he did. Now, is there any precedent for this approach in the Bible? I believe there is, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This morning we're going to look at a passage in Acts 17 that I I believe is just such a passage. I wasn't ready to leave Acts yet. It's been such a great journey through Acts. And and so I want to go back and revisit over the next two weeks a passage that has captured my attention for a long time. It's Acts chapter 17. Some background to this passage In Acts chapter 16, the passage, the chapter immediately before this one, God directs Paul to go from Asia to Greece across the Aegean Sea. In the first three cities that they visit in Greece, Paul and his friends are are either beaten or imprisoned or violently driven out of the cities. And so Paul's friends may have been asking him at this point, Uh, Paul, are you sure you got that message right? Because this doesn't seem to be going according to plan. Paul traveled with his his gospel posse. We know of of Silas and young Timothy and Dr. Luke. As much as, as Paul got beaten up, he was probably wise to travel with a physician. Let's pick up in Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Paul's friends have sent him on from from the last city they got thrown out of. They've sent him on ahead to Athens, perhaps for his own safety. He's something of a lightning rod, perhaps for their safety. Uh, Verse 16 says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, Athens will almost be a character in this story. Athens at this point in time was the the center of the cultural world in the West. This is an artist recreation of Athens as it would have been in Paul's time. Athens was the birthplace of democracy, the birthplace of philosophy. It was home to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, probably the three greatest philosophers that the non-Christian world has ever produced. 
It was home to the world's most amazing architecture, stunningly beautiful buildings, some of which are still standing today, some 2,500 years after they were built. In Paul's time, those buildings, some of them like the Parthenon, would already have been 500 years old, still in their full glory. Now, we're talking about Athens. Rome had conquered the Western world militarily, but Athens, east of of Rome, Athens was still the nerve center of the culture. So in terms of education and the arts and philosophy and law, and political theory and ideas, Athens had no rival, and Athens knew it. Verse 16 says that as this story opens, Paul is walking around Athens. He's probably still wearing bruises from his last several stops. He's waiting for his friends to arrive, and he must have have rubbed his eyes in amazement. As far as we know, Paul had never been to Athens before. But just days earlier, as we said, in his last stop, Paul had been beaten and thrown into provincial prisons. And now here he is released and he's standing in the glittering nerve center of the Western world. But whether Paul is is sitting on the cold stone floor of a provincial dungeon or whether he's standing at a podium in the center of the intellectual universe, His message is the same. He preaches Jesus, crucified and resurrected. Whether surrounded by prison rats or or silk-robed philosophers, he preaches Jesus in season and out of season. And this episode in, in Acts 17 is a model, a model of Christian engagement with the secular world, rather, whether the the ancient world or the modern world. This encounter takes place in Athens at a place called the Areopagus. Translated into English, Areopagus means Mars Hill. Several organizations uh, in the Western world have named themselves Mars Hill from this very passage. Just off the top of my head, I can think of a seminary on the West Coast. I can think of a university, uh, one of my favorite podcasts. There's a mega church in Seattle. Several large churches in urban areas have named themselves Mars Hill. Why would they choose that name? These institutions state a primary aim to engage secular culture to communicate the Christian message effectively to modern culture. And and not just to modern culture, but to the commanding heights of the culture. And Acts 17, this story, gives a warrant for, for taking the Christian message right into the command centers of culture. So for us, that's Washington, D.C., or Hollywood, or New York City or Wall Street. Athens was all of those in one place. Now, Christians have not always seen engagement with the world as a good thing. I'm reading a book right now, just for fun, on the history of American fundamentalism. It probably doesn't sound much like fun to many of you. Some of you may be unfamiliar with the term uh, fundamentalism, Many of us grew up in in churches or environments influenced to one degree or another by fundamentalism. It's a bit hard to define and pin down, but but one trait that is a a strong trait of fundamentalism is an impulse to disengage from culture, from society. And that impulse is understandable on one level. It's an attempt to preserve our Christian identity for ourselves and particularly for our children. Modern culture can feel like, is, a unique solvent, an acid bath, perfectly designed to dissolve Christian faith. We all sense that. We all want to avoid that kind of disintegration for ourselves and for our children. 
And so American Christians, and this, this particularly became evident about 100 years ago, the 19-teens, 1920s, as, as Christians sensed the liberal drift of the culture, the acceleration of secularism and, the, and the, uh, the society becoming more aggressively hostile to Christian belief. And so conservative Christians began to adopt a more defensive posture, sometimes a combative posture toward society. Conservative Christians largely disengaged from the secular university, from the media, from the arts. This might come as a surprise to many of people in this room under the age of 50, but for much of the 1900s, Christians avoided involvement with American politics. That didn't really start to change until the Reagan Revolution about 1980. And so that impulse in some ways was noble, which is, as we said, to avoid the corrosive influence of society. But in avoiding the ditch on, on one side of the road, it's easy to forget that there's usually a ditch on the opposite side of the road. In this case, yes, absolutely we can become too comfortable in in secular society, too influenced, even swallowed up by the culture on the one hand, or on the other hand is the danger of, of completely disengaging from the culture in an unbiblical way. And Paul offers us in this passage, Acts 17, a master class in how to engage a secular non-believing culture with wisdom, with skill, with humility, and with resolute faithfulness to the gospel. Verse 16 begins, Now when Paul was waiting for them at Athens. Have you ever been in a strange city by yourself and had some time to kill? Paul, waiting for his friends to show up. He's walking around this magnificent city. And no doubt, he was impressed by this stunning architecture as we said, some of it's still standing today, 2,000 years later. If I were walking around with Paul at his time, I would be probably googly-eyed at the, at the magnificence of it all. Undoubtedly, Paul was impressed by those things, but that's not at all what Luke mentions when he records this story. What does Luke say that Paul's primary emotion was in verse 16? It says, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Provoked is a strong word. The, the Greek word is paroxysm from which we get a word for a, a seizure. But why was Paul so deeply troubled? Because the city was full of idols. Idols. The great catastrophe of the human heart is idolatry in every age, taking things, often good things, that are not God and elevating them into the position of God and displacing the true God. The first commandment and the second commandment in the Old Testament deal with idolatry directly. Thankfully, in our modern non uh, non-superstitious culture, we don't have idols today, right? That was sarcasm. <laughs> because, because idolatry is, is always connected to what we worship, and everyone worships something. Idols are perennial weeds with deep roots in the human heart. So what does Paul do with this angst he feels about these idols? Does he go around, does he, does he go find the nearest hardware store and buy a sledgehammer and just go around smashing these things? No, verse 17 says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. First, it says, Paul spoke in the Jewish synagogue. This was his normal approach in Acts when he arrives at a new city. He first goes to the Jewish synagogue. These are people who are already religious, already 
know about God. They revere the scriptures. They don't know Jesus yet or worship him, but, but they are very religious. In some ways, it's a bit, uh, a bit like our, our modern Midwest, uh, the Bible Belt here where we live. But it says that Paul also reasoned, verse 17, in the marketplace. That is, among Gentiles, among non-Jewish people, most of whom had never heard of Jesus. And when I say never heard of Jesus, I mean literally they have never heard anyone mention Jesus, this Middle Eastern carpenter from Nazareth. Our church supports as missionaries a couple named Ryan and Shelby Webb who serve with the, Man with the Manam people who live on an isolated volcanic island off the coast of Papua New Guinea. The people there worship many gods. Uh, before they arrived, those people had never heard of somebody named Jesus. Let me tell you something about our own culture. In America, increasingly, there are places where the Christian story has almost completely died out, where people do not know the basic Christian story, the basic plot line. If you tell them about a guy named Jesus in, in certain places, largely along the coasts, but, but they may stare at you blankly. Our young people, our high schoolers who, who go to Boulder every other year, they encounter this kind of thing. In that context, in Paul's context, in, in the context of Manam off of Papua New Guinea, you, you can't even really start with the person of Jesus. You really have to go back to the beginning and start with creation. And that's what Paul does in his speech that will follow. He starts with Genesis. Uh, that's what the webs do. They, they go back to the basic beginning of the plot line of the Bible. And it would take them the better part of a year just to get up to the part of the story where Jesus is. Verse 17 says that Paul reasoned in the marketplace. A word about the marketplace. Don't think Central City Mall. I love the Central City Mall, but that's not the kind of place we're talking about. The marketplace of Athens was not just someplace you go to buy milk and eggs. This was a specific site in Athens called the Agora. The Agora was the place where everything important happened. Less like Jim's Foods and more like Chicago Board of Trade <laughs> or the Shanghai Stock Exchange, right? And remember in Paul's day, there's no internet, there's no instant communication, no phone lines. So if you want to conduct a business deal, whether large or small, this is where you go. In fact, especially if it's a large business deal, you go to the Agora. This is where the best lawyers set up shop, where the deals are done. This is the room where it happened. Again, not just trading a few chickens for some potatoes. We're talking about international blockbuster deals. So, so if you have a, a, a fleet of ships and you want to take a large quantity of grain from Athens to to Rome or Alexandria in exchange for silk or, or silver or slaves. The agora is where the deals are done, the marketplace. And not only that, but the greatest schools of education and philosophy are here in Athens. Athens is like Harvard and Yale and Cambridge and Oxford all rolled into one. It has no rival. The world's greatest art and architecture was produced here at the time. This is a painting by, by Raphael from 1510. Uh, the, the, the people in the Renaissance age uh, looked back in admiration at, uh, at Athens and the Greek culture about the time of Paul and, and, and admired it uh, for, its, for its art and its, its learning and its culture. What is it that Luke, the writer of Acts, wants us to see in Paul's address in the heart of Athens? Does Paul see Christianity as a private thing 
an internal matter, just Jesus in my heart, just a little cabin in the woods with me and my Bible? No. Why not? If Jesus is who he claimed to be, then he is king over the entire universe. And Athens, center of the cultural universe, must know who their king is. King over their philosophy, their education, their art, their architecture, their commerce and trade and economics. None of those things can become what they were meant to be if they are detached from their creator, their king, Jesus. Now, does that mean Paul, again, walks in with a hammer and starts smashing up these idols or walk in with a sword and demand that everyone follow Jesus, follow God's law? No. The kingdom of God is not advanced by force of arms or by coercion. Rather, the kingdom of God will always go forward by the proclamation of the gospel, very often accompanied by the suffering of those who proclaim it. That's what happened to Paul. That's what happened to Jesus. I remember being at a speaking event. This was a number of years ago, more than 10 years ago. And a, a Christian leader was was speaking at an event and he was relating a story of a protest that he participated in, a public protest against uh, some, some public practice that, that was worthy of being protested. It was a bad thing. And he's, he's there protesting it with a group of other people. And as he's protesting, a, a police officer approaches his group and asks them, to please back up and, and gain more distance from, from what they're protesting. And this Christian speaker, he boasted of, of what he did. He, he said, I, I walked up to that police officer and I thumped him on the chest and I said, this is our right to be here. You cannot tell us what to do. Don't be that guy. <laughs> that, that's not the model of Paul It's not the model of Jesus. Paul and Jesus both interacted with Roman centurions. They never stopped seeing the humanity of these people, even the people who were oppressing them, even people who were doing them wrong. They they continue to see them as as men that that God loves, uh, who need the gospel. Um, Yes, we are going to encounter resistance. Don't be a, what's the, what's the, I'm trying to think of the right word here. Don't be that person. Don't be ugly, right? If you encounter various trials for doing the right thing, count it all joy. Yes, we are going to encounter opposition. Don't be ugly about it. Uh, count it all joy that you are worthy to, to encounter a little bit of a taste of the opposition that, that Jesus and Paul faced. Is it true, though, did did Paul, did he really see Jesus as as Lord over everything? Let's back up just a couple of verses, still in Acts 17. The last place that Paul and his friends were at before they came to Athens, one of the last towns was Thessalonica. They got run out of Thessalonica uh, with pitchforks and torches. What did the, the leaders of Thessalonica accuse Paul and his friends of? It says in Acts 17, verse 7, uh, the the people of Thessalonica said, these Christians, they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. How can this be? How can Jesus claim authority over all things, over everything, over every atom in the universe? That question is going to be central to Paul's speech, which he will give at the end of this chapter, 
hold on to that thought. We'll, we'll dig more deeply into that speech next week. Verse 18 begins, Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Paul conversed with Athens' top philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics. Who, who are they? We know that Luke doesn't waste any details. Why does he mention these two groups by name? The Epicureans were not really all that different from modern Westerners like us. They believed essentially in a materialist view of the world. In other words, they believed that perhaps God made the world, but God left this world to run more or left on its own, like a, like a big machine, like a giant perpetual motion machine. It just runs on its own. Another word for that is, is deism. If there is a God, then he's, he's remote, he's far away. And what's really real is the physical material world that we can taste and see and touch and put in a test tube. And so the best approach to life is simply to pursue pleasure and material things. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the Stoics of verse 18 they're quite similar to Eastern religions like Buddhism or Hinduism. They were what we would call pantheists. A pantheist simply means God is the world or the world is God. It's sort of a, a new agey universal soul type of, of religion. It's nature worship because God is nature and nature is God. Their biggest problem was, was the problem of evil in the world. Because if the world contains evil, then, then in some way evil must be a part, uh, an essential part of God's nature. So the response is just to keep a stiff upper lip and buck up and, and keep going. That's, that's the Stoics. Paul goes toe to toe with these philosophers, the best trained philosophers in the Western world. I think we forget that Paul was one of the most brilliant minds of the ancient world, or of, or of any age, really. He studied at length under the world's leading Jewish rabbi, Gamaliel, and then he also received a world-renowned education in Greek and Roman culture. During his speech, which we'll look at later, he's going to quote the Greek and Roman poets and literature. I've been pondering for much of this week, I've been pondering Pastor Zeke's sermon from last week, if you'll recall from 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul says that he did not come to Corinth with long words or complex philosophical arguments. Now, Paul clearly had the intellectual chops to, to thrive in a place like Athens, home to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, do you know what Paul's next stop on his journey was after Athens? It was Corinth. Last week, when Pastor Zeke shared from 1 Corinthians 2, we read that, that Paul said he did not employ at Corinth lofty speech or wisdom. He says, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In Corinth, Paul came in weakness, he said. What he preached was, was foolishness to the Greeks. So how do we square this passage in Corinth with this passage in Acts 17? Again, these are back-to-back -back events in the book of Acts. How do, how do we square these two things? I, I really wrestled with this this week. And I, I believe that, that in 1 Corinthians, the passage we looked at last week, that Paul is emphasizing a crucial truth, which is that ultimately the ability to change hearts and minds or even cultures, it doesn't ultimately come from skilled oratory or rhetoric or articulate speech. Ultimately, it comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul, Paul knew that the, the response is due not to my rhetoric, but to the power of God. It's also seems to be the case that, 
that Paul may have modified his approach between Athens and his next stop, Corinth, not because his approach was wrong at Athens, but simply to suit a different audience. But however he suits his, his message to adapt to his audience, Paul never compromises his core commitment to the gospel. In both places, it says, he preaches Jesus crucified and resurrected. He adapts his communication style, but he never compromises on the core of the gospel. Later in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul will say, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's the language of, of rigorous intellectual debate and apologetics. Now, Pastor J.J. has been teaching a class for a number of months that's, that's an apologetics-based class, doing just this kind of thing. But when Paul preached a simple gospel in Corinth, it's not because Paul is a, is a know-nothing, uh, oh, shucks, I don't know nothing about all that education. It, it's not that Paul is some intellect, anti-intellectual. Paul was, was brilliant. He was, he was impeccably educated. But whether Paul spoke in weakness and in trembling in Corinth or went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the world's leading philosophers in Athens, he never relied on his own intellect, his own skills and oratory. He knew that all of that would be impotent if the Holy Spirit does not illuminate the truth to people's hearts and minds. He knew that God's Spirit is the only thing that can make blind men to see the truth, the only one who can make dead men live. And that's still true. Sometimes when I'm meeting with people, I, I feel like, oh, if I, could just, if I could just find the right word to say, if I could just phrase it the right way or come up with the right argument, maybe they'll get it. But that's not really how it works. But neither does that absolve me from the responsibility of, of trying to be the most effective communicator I can, I can be by God's grace and trying to understand my audience as best as possible. But the cross is offensive inherently that, that my sin was so serious that Jesus had to die for it. That is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. It will always be offensive to everyone everywhere, no matter how badly we want to connect or relate to or identify with those we're speaking with, we, we cannot lose sight of Jesus crucified and resurrected from the dead. Verse 18 says, And some said, What does this babbler wish to say? The word babbler is a funny word in English. It's also funny in the original in the original, it's associated with the chattering of birds. So think a flock of sparrows squabbling, chattering, picking up little seeds of thought here and dropping them there. When they call Paul a babbler, it's, it's derogatory, it's dismissive. Their next accusation in verse 18 is more serious. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. What's, what's so threatening about that? Actually, this is, in Athens, a serious charge. It's the same accusation that got Socrates put on death row a couple of centuries earlier. Because if you challenge the Greeks' gods, you're challenging the Greeks themselves, which is really not terribly different from, from every age and every place. If you challenge the gods or the idols of any particular place, you will be considered dangerous. You will become a threat to people's way of life. And in fact, don't be too quick to dismiss this threat that, that Paul's charged of. Don't say, oh, you know, 
Paul's, Paul's not trying to ruffle the, the feathers of society. He's, he's just talking about religious stuff. He's just talking about Sunday inside the church stuff. What's the big deal? Again, Paul claims that Jesus is king over everything, that all of these other idols are false gods. And when you challenge the gods or the idols of any people, you challenge the very core of their identity. So it's worth pondering, what are the main idols in America today? You ever asked yourself that question? If you were to say to a typical American today, you are not your own, you owe your allegiance, body and soul to God who made you, that God has a claim on your life, that you do not get to make up your own reality, that claim absolutely threatens people to this day. Perhaps the great American idol is my absolute autonomy, my absolute freedom, my right to do what I want. Sinatra, right? I did it my way. It's a disease that infects people regardless of their political persuasion. So either I am willing to hold up my idols to the spotlight of Scripture, or I am not. May God make me willing to examine everything I hold dear in the light of His Word. What is the core of Paul's message, verse 18 concludes, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's it. That's the steady heartbeat of Paul's message. And for this message, he has been beaten, stoned, imprisoned, shipwrecked, snake bit, starved. For this message, King Jesus crucified for my sins, resurrected in power and coming again. That's the core of Paul's message. Jesus, the resurrected King. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, if he really is creator and king over all the earth, then I must orient my life around his. Verse 19 says, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. They took Paul. The, the verb took there in the original Greek suggests coercion. Seems like they made him an offer that he could not refuse. They said, Paul, you're coming with us. We are inviting you to defend yourself. It was more like a trial than a guest lecture. This was exactly what happened to Socrates. We know that there existed a council in Athens, a governing body called the Mars Hill Council, the Areopagus Council. Likely, this council compelled Paul to make a defense of his beliefs. We know that this Mars Hill Council actually under Roman law was granted the authority to execute people under certain conditions. And so, they take Paul to the Areopagus, to ground zero, verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Verse 20, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. And Luke adds, as a footnote almost, that the Athenians and other foreigners, they spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Now, next week, we're going to drill down, as we said, deep down into the actual speech that we haven't gotten to yet. This was all just the setup to the speech. Paul's 
famous address was, was one of the most analyzed and studied speeches in all of antiquity. And Paul's defense, which he actually turns brilliantly into offense, he goes on offense with the gospel. We'll look at that next week more in depth. We began this morning with a true story of Matteo Ricci, friend to China from the 1500s. Matteo Ricci died in the year 1610. Right about the time he died, the Ming dynasty in China was collapsing. Ricci died in the Forbidden City and the emperor gave a special exception to Ricci. Foreigners, when they died in China, and very few foreigners were allowed into China, none into the Forbidden City. But when foreigners did die in China, their bodies were taken to the coast. They were not even allowed to be buried in Chinese soil. But the emperor himself arranged for Matteo Ricci to be buried in the capital city. A new Chinese dynasty came to power, the Qing dynasty. And surprisingly, the new Qing emperor, the great Kang Shi, he asked Ricci's students, who were also Christians, he asked them to stay in the city. He placed them in charge of the Chinese calendar and he issued a, a public proclamation that all Christians were to be protected and not harassed. And one of Ricci's young students uh, who followed in his footsteps, both in terms of his commitment to the gospel and his love of science, he was a young man named Johann von Bell. It's curious, the, the emperor, the Chinese emperor, liked Johann because Johann happened to be an expert in cannon technology. <laughs> the Chinese were at that point at war with the Dutch. But Johann's real love was not cannons, it was astronomy. He, the favorite thing he loved to study was calculating the movements of the sun and the stars and the moon. And Johann created accurate calendars to predict eclipses and the movement of the stars. The emperor put him in charge of, of calendar reform, actually allowed him to build a, a star observatory within the forbidden city itself. Johann and his friends built a, a stone church in Beijing. It's still there to this day, still standing. The future at this point looked really bright for, for these young guys and, and their influence over the upper reaches of Chinese society. Johann became a close trusted advisor to, to Emperor Kangxi. Unfortunately, Kangxi died in 1661 and a new emperor came to the throne who did not know Johann. Several top Chinese scientists who were jealous of Johann uh, they had Johann imprisoned in really terrible conditions. He was condemned to death. I'm not making this up. Death by slicing. <laughs> in April 16, 1665, while Johann was, was rotting in a Chinese dungeon, a terrible earthquake hit Beijing, followed just a few days later by uh, a meteor and then a mysterious fire that burned down the execution site. And at this point, uh, these events had the attention of the new Chinese Qing emperor. And so he called for a public contest between Johann, he released him from prison, uh, between Johann and his, his rivals, the, the Chinese scientists. And they were each given the task in, in this contest of solving three problems. The first, the first problem was to predict the length of the shadow of, a, of the sundial at a particular day at noon. The second test they had was to predict the position of the stars on a, on a certain evening. And then the third thing was to predict the exact time uh, of an eclipse that was coming up. And the emperor said, Heaven will be the judge of this contest. Now, Johann was, was very ill. He was dying because of his treatment in prison, but he was released and, and in, this context, in this contest, he was able to correctly uh, predict all three of these, of these things and pass all three of these tests. His rivals 
were completely wrong in their predictions, and the emperor sentenced them to death. It's a true story. It reminds me, does it remind you of any Old Testament stories? It makes me think of the story of, of Daniel in particular. I want to return as we close this morning to Paul's challenge from Acts 17. The challenge of engaging the culture without compromising the gospel. This is our challenge today. And I know that many of you out here are trying uh, really valiantly, heroically, to live in just this kind of tension. Many of you are involved in the fields of, of medicine or, or education. Some of you have, have positions in, in public office or public service or the school board. Um, and and uh, many of you others are, are in the marketplace trying to faithfully live out your faith. That's, that's a good thing. I want to affirm you and encourage you in that. Some of you are in, in the social services. You're, you're salt and light in, in difficult environments where, where you live and work. So I want to I affirm you in that. And, and I want to particularly say to young people who are here this morning, uh, be bold. <laughs> yes, you will face resistance. I can almost guarantee it. So did lots of Christians who came before us. So did Paul. So did Jesus. The Christian message is more than capable of, of standing up to the most rigorous intellectual scrutiny. So do not be afraid of engaging the secular world. God made science. <laughs> He's the king. Of, don't be afraid of science. Don't be afraid of of, of the arts or of education. Um, do not attempt this on your own, <laughs> in your own strength. We need the support of the church because it is possible, it happens every day that young people get swallowed up, swallowed whole by the corrosive effects of, of the world. But, but do, not, uh, do not fear uh, the, the ability of the gospel to, to stand on its own anywhere because Jesus is king over all reality, which he created. Don't do it in your own strength. The Holy Spirit always does the heavy lifting. Let me encourage you to avoid the ditches on both sides of the road. Let me encourage you to stay faithful to the gospel, even the offensive parts of the gospel in the face of a culture that is increasingly hostile to the Christian message. Let me also encourage you not to disengage from the culture as if Jesus was not the king, the creator of all of it. As if Jesus were not still actively at work, lovingly at work, as Colossians 1 says, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are the creator of all things, all reality, and we can delight in your creation. We can uh, take joy in exploring it more deeply because it all belongs to you and, and your good. I pray that you would strengthen our confidence in you, strengthen our, our, our sense that you are king over all of this, and and help us as we live in that tension uh, of staying faithful to you, to your gospel, uh, to, to join you in your work of reconciliation here on earth, uh, doing the work of heaven. We, we ask you for your help. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.